Hi, everyone. Welcome. The, yes. Oh, wow. I might get even more than that. How about, I'll do, I'll do it again, and then it'll feel really satisfying because you're all going to say hello back, okay? Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay. Woo, semi-satisfying. Uh, my name is Shannon Jackson. I'm the director of the Arts Research Center and associate vice chancellor for the arts and design, and it's a thrill to welcome you to our penultimate event in this series, uh, um, Arts Plus Design Mondays, and in particular, uh, a series devoted to the future of cultural criticism. This is our poster um, uh, that, has, uh, that chronicles what we've done so far. Our last event will be next uh, Monday, May 1st, with Dave Pell, founder of Next Draft and a Cal alum, with Deidre English of the J School, as a respondent. I hope you will come for our last event. Tonight, as many of you who have gathered here before know, we, we've been thinking throughout the year, really, about the role of cultural criticism, the changing role of cultural criticism in an age of digital platforms and digital circulation. We've had critics from television, film, art, literature, and performance thinking about how the digital sphere and new technologies have changed the nature of those medium, those art forms, as well as how we even understand the reception or dissemination and reflection about um, create, creative forms. We've also been thinking about how digital platforms have changed the nature of public dialogue in general, about what the role of the critic is um, and what the future of criticism might be. I'll think about that issue about how digital platforms are changing the role of the critic next to a thought from one of our panelists tonight, John Horn. This is a f a f one quote. We'll see if he still stands behind it. I think the real problem is that in a Rotten Tomatoes aggregate score world, the individual voice of the critic has been diminished categorically. And I think the voice of an individual critic now is, unfortunately, less meaningful than it has been. So let's see. How do we address, say, something like the, the democratic aspirations of a crowdsourced uh, platform like Rotten Tomatoes next to the idea of the voice of the critic, of the um, uh, uh, curatorial or experienced voice of the critic? What does it mean also to consider the digital itself as a medium or material for creation and for dialogue making um, and for critical thinking. Uh, when my collaborators and I, our faculty collaborators and staff collab collaborators began conceiving this th series back in August, September, uh, we were in a different mode about where we thought cultural criticism was going and the role of digital platforms. And of course, this whole series has been reframed um, after um, the election and after the inauguration, especially in the age of what some call the, the Twitter presidency. So for tonight's event, though, we're not going to think quite so much about Twitter, although we might. Uh, we're going to focus on radio and podcasts, on sound, and on criticism in general in the age of the so-called podcast. And I'm absolutely thrilled that we have an incredible trio here who offer really amazing perspectives on these questions. Tonight's program also, as you uh, may know, is curated by many departments and centers. Part of the idea for this series is actually to have a routine Monday night gathering curated by the faculty at UC Berkeley with the people and ideas that most compel us and my colleagues. And it's a series that we hope we will be able to keep up all next year as well. Uh, made possible to work by working in collaboration with BAM PFA so that we could open this beautiful theater on a dark night for all of you um, to find light on dark nights. Fiat Lux, you may know, is our, is our motto here at Berkeley. So tonight's program really continues this ser series that has been a, a true collaboration with the Townsend Center for the Humanities, the Arts Research Center, the Art of Writing Program, Black Room, and Digital Humanities. Uh, and it's part of a wider effort to make sure that we can create our own resource sharing, not exactly crowdsourcing, um, but partnerships that cross the arts, design, humanities, journalism, new media, and other disciplines at UC Berkeley. 
So in addition to thanking my faculty collaborators, especially Alan Tansman, I also really want to thank the, um, our, all of our staff collaborators, including Ann Weens, Sherry Goodman, Dave Taylor, uh, Colleen Barroso, um, Rebecca Eggers, Claudia Van Volcano, Laura, Laura Wolf, and particularly the amazing Lauren Pearson. Can you actually uh, help me thank them right now? <laughs> takes, takes a village. All right, who are these people? John Horn is a Cal alum and host of KPCC's The Frame, a daily arts and entertainment program, and now he is also the host of a new podcast series, Geffen Playhouse Unscripted, about which I think we'll hear too. He's covered culture for nearly 30 years and served as a culture and serves actually as a cultural leader and board member of a range of organizations in the arts and film industry in LA. Before his current role, he served over a decade as um, the at the Los Angeles Times as the lead writer on the film industry. Chloe Veltman is an award-winning culture reporter, critic, broadcaster, and educator. And she currently serves as the senior arts and culture editor at KQED here in the Bay Area. She's a former John S. Knight Fellow at Stanford and a New York Times Bay Area cultural correspondent. And she's also been a guest lecturer at a number of places, including San Francisco Conservatory of Music and at The Battery, a, um, a club in downtown San Francisco that some of you may know. Glenn Washington, uh, soon after winning the Public Radio Quest Talent Contest, sponsored by the Public Radio Exchange, Glenn Washington created and became host and executive producer of Snap Judgment on National Public Radio. As many of you know, the show's podcasts have received incredibly widespread acclaim, with one episode in particular, Unforgiven, named by The Atlantic as one of the 50 best podcast episodes in 2015. Washington also is an advisor and mentor um, serving um, many different organizations, educational and cultural in the region, and also served a, as the director of the Young Entrepreneurs of Haas program, yay, it's called, here at UC Berkeley. So if there's a chance, I think, of thinking deeply about the role of the critic in the age of rotten tomatoes, I think we couldn't imagine a better trio to help us do that thinking together. So please join me in welcoming this incredible group to the stage. So you may have to turn your micros, microphones on. Got it? But you're radio people. <laughs> you know how to do that better Ooh, than testing, I do. Testing, testing, testing. Oh, very good. OK. Uh, all right. So to get things going, I actually asked people to think ahead of time about, about some of these issues, about their current work in radio podcasts and the medium of sound, and to help us think about, um, about what it is to create and make use of radio and sound, what they think of themselves artistically, how they think about uh, the capacities of the medium, the difficulties of the medium, uh, and to get some examples in the air that help us start a conversation about what you, what you most feel you have to share with us tonight. So, John, you want to start sure. us off? Uh, right. I'm John Horn. The Frame is a daily half-hour uh, show on KPCC, and because of my background, most of the, I'd say about half the stories are film related because that's what I've covered my entire profession and that's what I gravitate toward. We also cover television, popular music, theater, visual art, there's some photography, um, there's some architecture. It's a mix of stories pretty much every day. Yeah. And we're based in LA, so any given day there is a variety of stories that we can choose to cover. And it's hard to figure out what it is that we're doing. And as I was, uh, driving to the airport this morning, I put on my Waze. I suspect many of you use Waze as an app to get from here to there. And I kind of think of the frame as a Waze for culture, that we're going to navigate a path to a destination. It may take you some places you don't normally go. It may take you to places you're familiar with. But we're going to get you from point A to point B. And along the way, maybe you're going to see some interesting things. So on any given day, we're looking not only for what we think is a good radio story, but a story that would be interesting to our listeners. And it tends not to be what I'll call commodity stories. So if there's a movie coming out and Ben Affleck's in a movie, we're not going to do the Ben Affleck story because you're going to see that story every other place. So we're looking for stories that are a little bit unique and can lend themselves to good storytelling. 
Uh, I'm going to play a clip from a segment we did not that long ago about Game of Thrones. There are many ways to cover Game of Thrones. We decided to do a story about the sound design of the dragon because A, it's great radio, B, it's about a craft that doesn't usually get a lot of attention in any format, and C, the woman who does the sound has a really interesting personal story. So I think it checks pretty much every box that we're looking for in a good radio story. And more important, it's not a story that I ever could have done as a print reporter when I was working at the LA Times. So I think, do we have that ready to go? It's about three minutes, so indulge us in a little Game of Thrones dragon sounds. I'm Paula Fairfield. I'm the sound designer on Game of Thrones, and I do all the kind of fantastical stuff on the show. The White Walkers, the Dire Wolves, Mammoths. But one of the biggest things, obviously, that I do is the dragons. Well, the funniest part about this is that <laughs> with the purr sounds, I hunted and hunted for just the right sound. And while I was trolling around, I found a sound of two giant tortoises having sex. <sighs> And uh, I'm not kidding. And um, and the moan from the male is what I took for as the basis for the purring of young Drogon. There's also very tender moments. And one of the things I have a dog that I train in police dog work, and uh, one of the most beautiful sounds from her is when she comes up and is very tender in my ear and there's a very tiny, barely audible nose whistle. And it's one of the most beautiful sounds coming from a very powerful animal. So it's a sound I started using uh, in the very bigger, like at last year when Drogon shows up, you'll hear these beautiful nose whistles. They're from my dog. And, um, <laughs> and that is another sign of just tenderness. Dragon. No, oh, it's always been personal. I mean, I tell myself stories when I create, I have to. And the trajectory of each scene, I find a story that I tell myself, and often it is personal stuff. Well, I'll tell you something that, um, <laughs> uh, so I got called in on this show in the fall of 2012. My father had passed away from cancer in, at the end of July. At the end of January, my sister passed away from cancer. They had been sick at the same time, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. It was one of the most difficult times in my life. And when I came back from that memorial of my sister, I spent three weeks doing nothing but playing with dragons. And I remember saying this was the most beautiful job that I could have and the best gift that I had, could have ever been given to heal from such a, a horrendous thing. And every scene I have something that I inject in it that gives me uh, something to follow. And that was the gift of Game of Thrones for me. I always say the dragon saved me. And, uh, and that is so very true. I, 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 they are an amazing gift to me and, and I enjoy absolutely every moment working on them. I don't think there's anything I can add to that. I mean, I think that, unfortunately, I wish we could do stories like that every day, but that is the best of what I think we can do as a radio show. It's an insight into the creative process. It's something you've never heard before. It's incredibly personal, her telling these stories about the people that she loves dying. Um, and I hope that represents you know, something that we can do on a radio show and a podcast that you really would never see or hear anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you, okay. Get some more sound in the air. Do you want to um, go next, Chloe? Sure. Um, well, is that okay? So uh, the short clip that I'd like to play for you... By the way, I'm, I'm Chloe Veltman. I'm the Senior Arts and Culture Editor at KQED. But the short clip I want to play for you um, is part of a project I created when I was the Arts Editor at Colorado Public Radio. Um, it's a sort of a sneak attack project. Um, and I want to play it because it, for me... It did some really unusual things uh, with the way that we think about 
not only an, an art form, in this case dance, but also the medium of audio. So the project was called Radio Dances and it was inspired by uh, um, a conversation I had with Ira Glass, the host of This American Life, who um, for a while was traveling around the country with a couple of choreographers, uh, Monica Bill Barnes and Anna Bass, and they were doing these shows on stage where you know, they would tell, Ira would tell stories and the dancers would do some dancing. I think Ira did a bit of dancing too. And when I talked to him about this, when he came through Denver, I said, oh, so Ira, you're a, you're a radio guy. Why aren't you doing this on the radio? And he said to, you know, said, talk to me as if I was a complete nutcase. You know, what are you talking about? You can't, you can't do dance on the radio. <laughs> and um, I thought this was a very strange comment coming from a man who's often quoted as saying that radio is the most visual of all mediums. So <laughs> it got me thinking in a way about this art form, you know, that's, that's very dear to me. And I started thinking about, well, what if you could do dance on the radio? What would that look like? So um, myself and my small team of arts reporters, we started engaging, we used social media and, uh, and call outs on air. And we started engaging, I want to say that a great swath, if not the entirety of the Colorado dance community and anyone else who happened to be interested in dance. Um, and we asked them, hey, send us 30 to 60 second long uh, audio dances, uh, whatever you, however you might interpret that. And um, we got submissions from everything from the Colorado Ballet to different tap dancers, hip hop people, um, flamenco, and, and then all kinds of universities, like the university dance departments, like UC Boulder or CU Boulder participated as well. And we got all these things, we created a huge web archive with them and they had accompanying descriptions and photographs. And we then we put them on air. It's a bit sneaky, because uh, I don't know that really the management of Colorado Public radio cottoned on to really what we were doing for a while. Um, but um, so, so uh, I did send a few of these pieces, um, which got really good responses. People thought, for the most part, some people thought it was weird, but for the most part, people thought it was kind of strange and wonderful. Um, I sent a few of these pieces to Ira Glass and to Monica Bill Barnes and to Anna Bass. And then we sat down and we talked about, well, can you do dance on the radio then? And uh, I, I, we ended up cutting like a 12 or 13 minute piece where Ira and Monica and Anna talked about this. Um, and uh, well, I, I just wanted to play you a little sample uh, of this, not because the interview is very interesting, but Ira has a, an interesting way of talking about it, and we'll get to hear one of my favourite radio dances. <laughs> so I think we have a, we might take a second to find the, the part in the story. It's seven minutes in, and. Uh, was another one that was called The Most of It by, by Wonderbound. And that one reminded me a little bit of that part of a chorus line totally. where they go like step, step kick, 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 I guess. <laughs> one of the things I've learned working with professional dancers is that they all have memorized all of a chorus line. Clearly not <laughs> totally accurately. <laughs> Both Need just a little did a brushing up. version on it. And what's great about the Wonderbound thing is, is that once they get going, they actually start to say things that aren't dance steps. And that's my very favorite part of it, where they go like, help, I'm falling, pause, shake my hand, nice to meet you. And you can picture that as dance moves. Well, let's play that part. Step, I'll change, step, change, step, 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 swipe. Come here, uh, 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 catch uh, that, uh. sweep. Starters, lazy Susan. Slide out over grass, Suspend. shoulder, that's my bad shoulder. Meow, my comma, button, period. Step, I'll change. Step, chug, he'll step. Climbing up, invert the body. Right step, pivot, down. step, Woo. pivot. Slide it out nicely. Swish. Swing it around. Lazy, Lazy Susan, Susan, shoulder push. Help, I'm catch. Sliding. Help her yeah. up. Pause. Stair, 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 Play. stair. Shake nice hand. to meet you, swizzle. Downside Woo. up. Bite. Ouch. Slap. Ouch. I'm falling. Catch. Sliding. Slide her up. Step. I'll change. Step. step chug. chug. He'll step. Yank. Slide it on over. I'm Here she comes up. up. Pause. Slowly, down, slowly, down, slowly, down, slowly. Down. Push, rolling, push, rolling, push, rolling. Push. Sitting up. Brush it off. Help, Help her up. up. Brush her off. off. Scooch it back. Step. I'll change. Step. I'll change. Step. Chug. He'll step. He'll step. He'll step. He'll step. Stop. And, but then my, my favorite of all of them was this one called Hello Blue Soul by Eric yeah. So, um, <laughs> So that was just one of, I think, something like 150, 200 submissions we got in the end. But um, 
uh, the, what was interesting about it was uh, Ira and his team thinking that, in fact, he would he does actually think it's a viable medium via audio. He wouldn't want to listen to a 20 minute long audio ballet, which I don't think any one of us would want. But um, but you know, a, like a 30 to 60 second piece that you could just grab from wherever he thought might be delightful. But I also just want to quickly say that this project, though it seems very sort of esoteric and weird and maybe a bit sort of inside baseball to some people, um, had some really positive effects. Um, I heard from a lot of people who said that it, they had never thought of radio as, as something that visual. It helped them to think that way. I heard from a lot of the dancers that were involved that they it got them thinking about dance in a different way. Um, and another thing that we never imagined was that it brought the dance community together in a way. Um, I know of three separate projects that happened as a result of what we did, because, you know, the flamenco people never talked to the hip-hop people, never talked to the contemporary ballet people, and we brought them all together because we did these series of live events where we had the audience experience the, 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 the ballet, the, the pieces, first with their eyes shut and then with their eyes open, and we had a lot of sort of socialising around it. And that's the other thing, you know, maybe we'll get to this later on today, but I think a lot at KQED, because we're not a radio organization, at least not on the art side, really. We do some radio, we do a little bit of TV, but for the most part, we're very digital. And um, and so I'm thinking, and, 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 and analog in the sense of live events. So I'm trying to think of everything uh, in terms of, you know, do we want to be in a room with people? Do we want to be a podcast? Is it video? Is it what, you know, what is this thing? And sometimes it's a combination of all these things. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of the storytelling is heading. Okay, awesome, thank you. Chloe, uh, and Glenn, do you want to get one more piece out there? I'm already sure. bursting with a bunch of questions, <laughs> but I'll restrain myself. Hi, everyone. My name is Glenn Washington um, from Snap Judgment. And we started Snap um, really as a way to, the idea was we want to create movies of the mind, a cinema of sound idea. And, the, and to try to get personal, try to you know um, speak two different languages. We want to be as smart as anything that was heard, but we also want to speak that heart language as well. And so I want to play you a short clip. Um, I start off every single episode with a personal story of some sort. And just to kind of give you an intro, some of you might not have heard the show before, but this is a three minute clip, just an open to snap judgment, and uh, it's the close knit. Okay, so my dear friend was pregnant. Everybody was excited. But then the doctor said, something's wrong. They put her on bed rest. And for my friend, this was not easy. But she was going to do everything she could. They told her not to move. So she didn't move. But then she started having pain, started having these pains. And her water broke. Too early way too early, months too early. But the baby had to come out, premature. Mother and child were whisked to a neonatal intensive unit and only parents were allowed to visit. I was not a parent. But the daddy was on the other side of the world trying to find a plane and my friend said, I need someone here. So when the nurse asked me, are you the daddy? I told her, yeah, I'm the daddy. And the nurse, she told me to scrub my hands with soap and the special brush before she took me to the incubator. And she looked like a little baby bird hooked to tubes and wires and monitors, so, so tiny. My friend, the child's mother took my hand. I told her to go to sleep, go on to sleep. Are you sure? Go to sleep. She finally left, and the nurses told me that what the baby, what a tiny baby under two pounds really needs is skin-on-skin -skin contact. What can I do? They told me to strip. They set up a tent, an anti-contamination tent, and sent me wearing nothing but my boxer shorts inside. The monitors kept beeping and beeping, rhythmic. The nurse picked up this little baby and her little mouth opened. The monitors went crazy, alarms, red flash and shrill, loud. I have never been more scared. And she put that tiny baby on my chest and all those 
noisy monitors, all that crazy calamity. Calm down. Calm down to a heartbeat. Her heartbeat. Skin to skin. She felt so soft. She looked so beautiful. I thought I had lied when I told the nurses she was mine. I looked down and saw her and knew whatever the biology right then. For that moment, she was mine. And you know what? When I see her now, riding her bike with that big old horsey laugh, and I ask, who's your favorite? I don't care who she says. I don't care because I already know. Today, on Snap Judgment, from PRX to NPR, Close Knit. Stories about the ties that bind. So what we're trying to do, again, is um, this, uh, the, the idea of, uh, of non-biasedness and all sort of thing that is kind of central to how people have always viewed public radio. We're trying to knock all that stuff down and, um, and just go direct and say, speak the way people, I shouldn't say we speak the way people speak because we don't. It's stylized, you know this, but we are trying to make those movies of the mind, trying to turn regular everyday scenes into narrative cinema. Okay, I, I, I mean, just ha having those three things out and circulating, I, I wonder if you have some thoughts for each other. I mean, I feel like it's both, uh, it seems but all of the, these clips are either, they're talking about what r radio and sound perhaps can do as a medium and, and, and what it can do that perhaps other media can't. And at the same time, there's also a kind of challenge to the medium <laughs> of, of, of giving yourself what sounds like an impossible task, like dance on the radio and seeing what happens when you do that. So I just wonder about the evolving sort of elasticity of the medium, maybe. I mean, I think all these stories dramatize a relationship between the listener and the show that you can't find anywhere else. And I think it is even more unique to podcasting that Radio, you might stumble upon, you might be in your commute, you might have it preset to a certain station, but if you're listening to a podcast, that's a destination, that's an appointment. Mm -hmm. You have selected that podcast, probably because you've selected that host and his or her curatorial efforts and storytelling. So there's a relationship that is much more active than passive. And the stories, I think, that we all played are stories that really engage people on an emotional, personal level. And I think that's a little bit of the difference between podcasting and radio, mm -hmm. and it's also the difference between good audio storytelling and generic audio st storytelling. I do wonder about these terms, you know, the, disting the distinguishing between podcast and radio at this point, because I, I don't know um, how useful. I, I tend to just think of it all as audio and, you know, it plops in different places depending on where it fits. And also just because so many of our podcasts, the most popular ones anyway, are also radio shows. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I know there are some differences, right? With a podcast, you can, you can go on for longer if you want. You're not tied to that, you know, four minute window or whatever it is for a feature. But, um, and you know, you can, that you can be more intimate, but I've, heard some really, really intimate traditional radio stories too, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know how useful it is either. I do think this, and even I don't even think it's necessarily audio. What's happening is that the anybody can make anything. And video, like you can make a, a movie for less than the cost of a used car. And when that happens, that means that everyone, you know, everyone gets to put a foot in the pool. And which is awesome, which is fantastic. Um, I know for myself, uh, myself and my partner, Mark Ristich, me close, Mark might be clinically, but uh, we're both kind of on the ADHD spectrum. <laughs> and, but, um, and so what I love about audios particularly is that you can, we make so much content, so many stories in a way that television where you have to kind of slow down and, and film, you have to slow down a lot. It's not gonna be possible. Um, and that 
that's from 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 my from my perspective, that is a great strength. The great strength is if you don't like this, wait five minutes. Um, and um, we're re- I mean we we try as hard as we can, obviously, without being precious. But the idea that anyone can take up a, a microphone and um, sound editing equipment are pretty basic tools to be able to bring someone into your world. And to think that you can do that right now, that the entire edit suite can fit into a, um, a laptop or right now onto a phone is stunning. Um, and it just changed everything. I think there is a fundamental difference between radio and podcast because we are a radio show that's on KPCC, which, depending on the month, is the largest NPR affiliate in the nation. So we have 900,000 listeners, but our audience is finite. There's a limit to how many people are going to listen any quarter hour of the day, whereas the podcast, the audience is infinite. And to come back to something you were talking about, the barriers to entry being very low, we have what I think is a really well-produced show. There's not a lot of us. There's five of us who put the show together. And I go on the iTunes charts to see who is doing well in terms of downloads on podcasts. And I see guys who are in their basement wearing their Quentin Tarantino t-shirts, talking to each other for an hour and a half about nothing. And they're beating us. And I say to my editors, I go, how the hell is that happening? We're putting together a really highly produced show with great guests and we're getting creamed by these guys in their mom's basement. And it, it's not, and it's the relationship between the audience and the, and the producers. And it's not about always the quality of the content. I, I want to just add something to this. I was out to dinner a couple weeks ago and the adults did the adult thing, the kids did the kid thing. And when we got together to have the meal, they showed us, the kids showed us what they were making in the bag. And they had this little music video that they had just done in the, you know, the half hour we were having drinks. And I thought, that's who I'm competing against. And I will lose every single time against my dog. Because it was a funny little thing with the swirlers and stuff like that. Um, and it, I mean, if you think about the future, I get really, really, really scared. Um, this is, if I may, this, those who've been coming to this series know that this has been a continued theme. In the, the amazing dem- uh, democratization of the tools or the democratization of the, the world where everybody's a critic for those who are interested in criticism per se, or, or last week we were talking about YouTube and the, um, and yeah, the, the people in the basement. Can, can we like think a little bit m- more then about what the, the professional future feels like for those entering here in this world where everybody can dip their toe? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that everyone has to have a place where they can experiment at the start. Um, and the democratization of the equipment makes that possible. Um, and then things sort of percolate in the ecosystem. But it strikes me right now, at least, it really helps if you're an independent podcast producer to have some sort of endorsement from somebody who's in the system and very famous. I mean, when I think about um, how I find out about new podcasts, more often than not, it's because I'm already listening to Radio Lab or something like that, you know, um, S Town. I don't think they did it on S Town. Maybe they. No, I don't think they promoted anything. But anyway, I'm, you, you hear, you know, Jad or Bumrad or whoever it is. These rock stars in the world of, uh, of of podcasting and radio promoting these newer pieces. You know, I heard. Um, I think it was on Radio Lab. They were promoting Two Dope Queens, which I had vaguely heard of. You know, but it was hearing them talk about it that made me go listen. So um, there seems to be this path right now that um, is a way that that things sort of move through the system and then get that exposure. It's not the only one, of course, but that's the one that seems to be very much of the moment. And at KQED, you know, our, our, our senior people are all tech, okay, we've got to cross promote the hell out of all these things that we're, you know we're just starting these a lot of experiments and podcasts and the instruction is okay I want on all these different shows that you're doing you've got to talk about this new podcast you've got to talk about so um, 
that's how people hear about it, and it's an important part of the process. And we should, I should explain, too, what the numbers look like, because the numbers are staggering. Mm -hmm. um, there was a report by Edison Research that came out recently, and they're looking at people who say they're podcast listeners that listen to a regular podcast, people who identify themselves as podcast listeners 10 years ago, 11% of the population. Last year, 36% more than threefold increase. Um, the number of a podcast that the average podcast listens to is five podcasts a week. 21% of all podcast listeners listen to more than six podcasts a week. Podcast listeners now listen to more podcasts than they do radio. I mean, the, those numbers are staggering. And then there's the dollar numbers, which are equally staggering. NPR made $10 million off podcasts last year, which is a threefold increase. Uh, from the previous year, Podcast One, uh, which is the network that the Skeffen Show is carried by, has 200 podcasts. They did a billion and a half downloads last year. Um, and you could talk about embedded advertising uh, and dynamic advertising, but the growth is, you know, 25% plus. Yeah, we and it, and it may be that we're in a bit of a... Either we're on the we're, we 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 we're not sure which inning we're playing right now. Yeah. A lot of us are really we're not quite sure uh, because still the advertisers are the Blue Aprons, the Audible dot coms, and Stamps. Yeah. That's that's who you're gonna hear um, doing a Mailchimp, of course, Mailchimp. Um, and it hasn't become as um we we were we're waiting for the rest of the people to start pl making plays, but they really haven't yet. And it's it's kind of we're wondering why not. Uh, why why are advertising but budgets still slow to get to that podcast medium? Um, I think it's because they're sheeple and um, they're in, afraid to. I mean, even like when you when you recognize the relationship between the uh, the the uh, podcast and the audience, it's very 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 tight. Uh, the what we we because uh, to supplement the ad budget, we go directly to the. Uh, people who listen to the show and they come through every single time. If they can write us a check for nothing, besides getting more of the show, then you would imagine that they they have enough of a relationship that if we say this product that I like, because like we're we're right now I'm working with some potential alcohol. I I think that Snap goes great with cocktails. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I think so. I think that it's it's ripe for that type of um, investment from the other ad communities, and and it's and it's been slow to happen, and we'll see. But um, I think it will, because the deal, the big deal right now is, and this is really great, kind of what John was saying. The big deal right now is that podcasting is such that everyone is still will. There's not enough money in it, so that there are a bunch of assholes. And everyone will still talk to everyone else. Um, you can talk to just about, it's hard to get a hold of Ira, but um, <laughs> you can just about talk to just about everybody. And when you want, and when, and again to what John was saying, the, um, if you want to get, uh, like we made our break when we were featured on This American Life, let's say. Um, when we feature someone else, they make a break. And this really, it really goes down. It really goes down, and I think that um, and what and what people who are looking to make to get in, um, you can if you make something for like a, a show that you are trying to get their their uh, their listenership for. Now it's such because it's so hard to make something good. If you give somebody something that is like, hey, here's a gift for you. If the, it might, maybe it work, maybe it doesn't, but if it I mean, we are, if you give me a story that works for Snap, I will kiss you on the mouth because <laughs> it is so hard to get, to make this stuff on an hourly, every hour, an hour once a week. Same like, I know that if you can actually hit Ira, same thing here. If you can hit Jad, they will love it. Um, and every and everyone is like that right now. Everyone's scrambling. And um, it really is the best way to, to, to break. Can I jump in here? Something about um, the advertising model and podcasts, uh, which does distinguish them in some way. So in some ways, I'm going back on my whole thing that I was saying about... They are... I think... I still think there's audio, but in this way, podcasts distinguish themselves, some, is that they are often about very specific things in a way that, you know, traditional radio will take you from soup to nuts through everything. Um, for five years, I hosted and produced 
uh, a podcast and radio series out of a station called KLW in San Francisco called Voice Box. It's because I love, I'm passionate. I'm a total singing nut. I'm obsessed with singing. I'm obsessed with the human voice. Um, and so this was a show that every week dealt with a different subject to do with the human voice. Now, because it was so niche and frankly, people were very surprised that I could come up with a topic every single week on this, but I did for five years. Um, and would have continued if I hadn't buggered off to Denver. Um, I was able to attract um, advertisers and supporters who were really, really interested in the vocal music community. So, you know, the American Speech Language Hearing Association uh, basically floated my boat for a while. And, and, and other sort of companies are interested in music education and things like that, you know. So I think that there's, if, if you're, if you're podcast is, is niche enough, you can sometimes tap into the support and the advertising of those specific companies. You know, it, 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 in some ways, although maybe the amounts are smaller, the amounts of money, um, it's, it's also a way to, to make it financially viable, particularly when you're starting. That's a really good point. And I, I do think one of the first things that you want to ask yourself when you're starting a, a podcast is, are you going to go mass market or are you going to go niche? Because... Um, I mean, you can do both. You can do either or, but know it going in what you're trying to do. Um, and I will say that, uh, like, um, for us, my, our first hire was a guy by the name of Roman Mars, who now um, has his own podcast, 99% Invisible. And I think that going, when he, when he left, what if ours is kind of a general-based show, he decided he wanted to go very, very, very specific. I'm going to do design. But it turned out not to be that niche at all after all. Uh, he was able to really tap into a large market in very much like what Chloe was saying, the uh, the ad, he, he wasn't getting the, the the huge types of ad, now he does actually get it, but he was getting these these little design firms who knew they could they would actually sponsor a podcast, um, and they did. Yeah, interesting. So when, uh, it, it, it seems, at least in some of the, the some of your examples seem niche examples, but you're saying also that you're, to use a metaphor you used earlier, John, you're, f you're almost w functioning as ways, ways people for each other. Like, in addition to curating your own show, you're also pointing to each other, you're kissing each other on the mouth for sharing, <laughs> um, but there is a way that you're kind of ground up support network amongst niche and special, um, special voices, maybe. Something like that. I think so. No. Do you not think so? I think you're trying to make your show. Um, yeah. And if you can do so, yeah. and, 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 um, and obviously, especially from my, my own perspective, is I want to bring in particular, I want to bring in people of color and women to the, to the, field, to the field. And so mm -hmm. I'm actually, I'm gonna, that's definitely going to be a, a priority of ours, but at the end of the day, I got to make the show. Right. Okay. So thinking about actually that topic about how you find audience and how you cross promote or don't promote and how, how, how people find you that want to hear you. And now thinking about this other value about making sure that a range of voices get heard. I just, I wonder if you could um, think a little bit about, you could say the political effects of of this kind of dissemination and circulation, how, say, it squares with what people talk about as the sort of algorithmically curated news content that where only certain people find certain voices and, and, and how or whether you can fight that. Is there a way that you're contributing to the bubble thing that we hear about and or how do you puncture that? Um, this may sound facile. I think you don't give people an opportunity to change the channel or to tune out. Um, that if you are listening to your own show and say, I'm bored, you've lost your audience, and that's the way in which you tell your stories, the way in which you select your stories, that there are going to be people uh, who have absolutely no interest in opera, who might hear a segment that we're doing about opera because we're telling it in a fresh way that it's interesting and it's compelling. I think that's a huge challenge to not give people an opportunity to change the channel as opposed to this is a great story because they're, they're not always necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could I play a clip um, that I think will answer, at least from our perspective, this question a little bit? Um, Which one? It is the, uh, the video. The video. Well, going down this dig deep road, 
Next on the Snap Judgment stage, I am so excited. First time ever on the Snap stage, but he is only 15 years old. You might think that doesn't qualify him to tell a story here today, but just you wait. Please put your hands together for Mr. Noah. When my mamas fight, they go on long car rides, come back, and I hear our car stay still. They come in and Robin goes directly to the bedroom angry. Maria will sometimes make toast, pour water. I sit in my room quiet, listening like a radio antenna. My mamas drive a CRV. They bought it brand new. The car is big boned practical. It is our car. I have been one with this CRV for so long now. We used to drive for miles out on the highway until I fell asleep. It has taken me to martial arts practice and school plays. This is the car that drove me to the gay pride parade where I skipped through the crowd throwing mini Oreos. This is the car I'll learn to drive in, the car I'll remember. Last Tuesday night, my mother Maria comes into the house with a weathered smile. My other mother, Robin, and I are sitting in the room. Maria asks us if we'll take a drive with her. So we all get in the car, our hearts thudding in offbeat unison. And as we drive, silence settles in. And I wonder, and then I know, this is it. And I didn't imagine it would end like this. I didn't imagine an ending at all, but if they were going to tell me about the divorce, what a way to do it. I sit in the back seat. I wonder when they'll say it, how they'll say it. I think about how my time will be split between them. I wonder what'll happen when they see each other afterwards. Will it feel like collisions? I don't want to meet a new girlfriend. I I can't imagine anything but this. Its ending is unthinkable. My heart hurts at the thought of our last miles, these miles. Who will take the CRV? In the back seat, I think about how lucky we were to have had this family. Their 20 years of marriage, my 15 with them. I remember when Maria drove away one night without saying where, when Robin packed up her things one day and Maria ran outside to stop her from leaving. I remember when I came to them crying at the idea of separation. I remember when Robin came out sobbing. I remember when Maria whispers at Robin to be quiet and Robin yells louder. I feel these walls crumbling. I don't want this life to end. Maria starts to talk. I pinch my leg and look out the window. She tells me that our car, our CRV, is just 13 miles away from reaching 100,000 miles now. <laughs> I wonder if this is part of the divorce speech or just a distraction. <laughs> I feel angry, they should just say it. She tells me the reason we took this ride is so that we could all be there to reach 100,000 miles together as the people who matter in her life. Slowly, I come to the realization that this isn't a breakup ride. This is a stay together ride. We're in the car and we're driving on a Tuesday night and we're 99,987 miles in. We stop for onion rings and Sundays. keep driving 99,993 miles. 99,996 miles, Elton John. When we get to 99,999 miles, we hold hands, clasp Melissa Etheridge, and sing Lucky at the top of our lungs. There are two main reasons that my mama found love in each other's presence. There are too many moments when we are unbreakable, and in this moment, our one family, constructing road as we go, burning bridges behind 
Now, the reason why I wanted to play that clip for you and answer to this question was when we first started SNAP, first thinking about it, I was watching Crossfire. And it was two jackasses braying at each other about some nonsense. And you watch that, and you've never, no one in the history of the globe has ever felt compelled to change their mind after watching this <laughs> spectacle about anything, ever. And I realized that, you know, narrative actually can. When you just, he wasn't trying to convince anybody of anything. But I, I, I was stunned and delighted before the uh, Supreme Court ruled on the legality of gay marriage that this thing was being passed around all over the country in the red states and in the blue states. It was a story about a kid, about his family. And you talk about, uh, um, and it was, it was one of those things. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't pushing anyone out. And I think that that, become, that goes back to the content creators themselves. We can make stuff that would be, you know, that would be very, I could aim it at a target. But um, what, I, what I, I will say that I'm happy about is still being part of the radio uh, atmosphere is that people can hear this by accident in West Texas. And I, and I like that. I still, I really do like that. And I do think that it's problematic to have this atomization happening, and I think that the only way we can do, we can fight it, is to make content that people want to hear, no matter where you are. Another thing to do uh, with getting outside of the echo chamber and the bubble um, is the way in which we're using a lot more crowdsourcing these days to get at story ideas, and um, we've we've done that extensively. Um, there is a clip I, I want to play you from a podcast series we launched about maybe a year and a half ago called um, Bay Curious, and that's where and it, and and it wasn't um, it wasn't an idea that that was new to KQED. I believe it was inspired by a similar project that's happening maybe I don't know if it's Chicago or Boston, somewhere like that. But anyway, there. There's a call out, and people can find um, a form online, or they can call, or they can email, and any question they want answered, uh, they can write it. You know, questions about you know why is why do why is San Francisco sourdough so special? That's the piece that just came out. Um, you know, or what what's the what's the thing about the the wave at the ballpark that people do? Um, or there's an interesting, weird-looking house down on the 280 that some people had spotted. What's, what's up with that house? It looks like a Smurf house. And then uh, the, the, uh, our audience members get to vote on what question they want answered that week. And then a KQED journalist will go out and answer the question. And we do it uh, a lot with the podcast, but it's also there are video, there's video uh, stories as well as part of this series um, and some written ones. But anyway, I wanted to play you a little bit of a clip uh, that show, to illustrate the one that we did um, recently about the name of San Francisco. And someone had a question about this. And the nice thing about these stories is often the member of the public who suggests the question will get to come along for the ride with the reporter. But if you don't mind, let's just fire up. A, I'm just going to play, I don't know, like a couple, two and a half minutes. And it's front. interesting because this is kind of using crowdsourcing rather than being at the mercy of the crowdsourced aggregator. You're deploying it to try to get different perspectives rather. Um, exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Turning Rotten Tomatoes into a different. <laughs> this is Bay Curious and I'm Olivia Allen Price. I met this week's question asker near a playground in Oakland's Chinatown. My name is Rena Yang. I grew up in Oakland, California. When Rena was growing up, she'd come here a lot to hang out with her friends after school. Her family spoke Chinese at home, so she relied on these friends to learn the local lingo. My friends, they're the ones who taught me all the slang words that I know. Like this one. They'll say Frisco this, Frisco that. So I would say Frisco. Rena used the nickname for years and didn't think much of it. Until one day when she was sitting next to a coworker. I think I just threw out the word Frisco. She stops me or she kind of looks at me and says, Wait, I thought people don't like that name. And I said, really? I didn't think so. Suddenly, Rena felt like an outsider. I was thrown. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> Ever since then, it's been bugging her. 
So she wanted to know. Why do San Franciscans not like the nickname Frisco? So Frisco. We asked what you thought about the word on social media and heard back from hundreds of you. It's the biggest response we've had since we started the show, so we know the nickname stirs quite the debate. The thing is, if you go way back, how you feel about Frisco is all tied to who you are and where you're from. Here to help us make heads or tails of it is one of the masterminds behind our show, Bay Curious producer Vinny Tong. So you want to know how annoyed people get by Frisco? Pretty annoyed. You know, I keep it as San Francisco when people say like Frisco. Yeah, so and I it, encourage you to go and find that that segment at KQED. Download the podcast. Uh, okay, a, a, a few, a few. Uh, I had a couple more questions, um, and then we're going to turn it over to um, the audience, who um, I know are going to have comments and questions for us. Just a couple of things in thinking about different aspects of the medium that I feel have come up that may be changing or may not, but. Uh, First of all, uh, you all have in some way invoked the relationship to the visual and sound. Could we think more about why, why might radio be a visual medium? Um, another, another sort of fact of the, or factor in the medium is, do you ever think about when you're making something that might be received um, quietly or solo? to the ears of a single person experiencing it by themselves as opposed to how we're experiencing these sounds now? When is, when is it sort of social and when is it not? And then this other factor of um, the podcast being delivery on demand means that we are not necessarily listening together or listening at a specific time. Is there anything about that change of not listening at a specific time or, or even together? Anyway, these are a few different factors. I wonder if any of them feel... I'll take the third one because it's interesting because I've been a print journalist my entire life. And as a print journalist who is a news reporter, I was always told to eliminate myself from the story. Hmm. That the story was not about me. It was about the people that I was writing about. And when I started doing radio a couple of years ago, my editors and producers were like, we need to hear more of you. Hmm. And I, didn't, I re resisted that. And you heard it. Uh, you know, in that piece you were doing about Frisco, I think it's kind of in the DNA of that story about the car hitting 100K, that people, I think especially on, in podcasts and radio, they want to hear the person. That's why Serial and S-Town work. Mm -hmm. Their stories are interesting, but the story about the person in the story is, as, is even more interesting. And that's been a huge learning curve for me to talk about myself, my reaction to a story, because I've been trained all of my professional life to cut that out. And regardless of people are listening to podcasts in a group, or I think they're almost always listening to them by themselves, that is the relationship they want. They want to know who that person is. They want to feel like they're having a conversation with that person. And also that aspect can be a thing that makes a story very visual. Um, I was just listening to a segment of this podcast called Love and Radio, uh, it was an old segment produced in 2011 about um, this guy in Detroit called Jay Thunderbolt who owns uh, a strip club. He runs a strip club out of his house. And he's an interesting, very menacing, menacing character in a lot of ways. But he has this whole other side to him. But the thing is, the reason you, you can really understand, you, you, you feel like you're in this guy's house in Detroit and you feel that he's got, a gun, he's got a 38 and he pulls it out. And you know all this because you are hearing so much of the detail of the journalist who's telling this story. Um, and, and you sense his fear and his apprehension, but he wants to be there in the room and he desperately wants to know about, you know, what motivates Jay Thunderbolt to do what he's doing? And why is this guy who's packing, he's like, he was shot in the face, he can't even talk very well. But, but you picture the room, and, he t and, the, and the narrator is, is, is ex describing, the journalist is there with you and telling you how he feels, and, and you get a sense, you can, he tells you how, like the smell that he experiences in the room and what he's going through. And this, I think, is what makes the story not only intimate, but spatial and visual and, and activating much more of your senses than just your ears. Of course, this isn't a new idea. I don't know how um, 
But, but it isn't. I mean, we did a story a week ago about Lauren Greenfield, the photographer. She has a new show called Generation Wealth, and it's a series of photographs about our national obsession with money and fame and sex. And it's me walking around the gallery reacting to the photographs. And if I'm not reacting, it's, it's art. It's a, like, dance. You think it can't be done, but it's about how I'm looking at these pictures with Lauren Greenfield, what they say about the country, how they predict the election of Donald Trump. All, there's a conversation around the art, and you end up, I hope, if the piece works, thinking about what these images look like, even though you haven't seen any of them, based on my talking about them and reacting to them. Yeah, I really think, going to the other part of your question, that in the past, like five years ago, let's say, the relationship we became kind of headphones nation. And I, when, I, when we first started this show, I thought the ideal way to listen to it might be in a concert hall somewhere. And that has completely changed. I think that it's such a generous thing when someone puts their headphones on and comes over into our universe uh, for an hour or so. And, that, and, and it's really gone into how we think about the sound design of the show and the way that we're going to experiment with the whole design. How can we push this? If you are, because understand, when you listen to a show on the radio riding down the street um, with your kids screaming in the back and, you know, the, and, the, and the jackass cutting you off or whatever it may be, that's certainly one way to listen to a thing. But this is something else entirely. And it, it, it becomes, in effect, a different medium. Now, and, and two, that means like uh, we, as, you know, podcasting, no one, no one has ever, I don't care about podcasting. Uh, no one ever has cared about this particular delivery system. We do live shows. We'll do um, all kinds of different ways of, of getting, we'll do um, television, whatever it may be. Um, this is one type of delivery system, but what we're really trying to do is, I think, how do we, we got stories, so how do we get them to you? How do we serve it your way? Uh, and, and, and these various, because the technologies are bursting, like we want to deliver you not just audio, we want to deliver you video on your machine as well. Or we want, and um, here's a Snap Judgment music curation system that we do, or here's a recommendation engine of other things. This, what you, we're finding is like right now, um, it used to be that the competition for us on a radio situation might be the other radio station. Now, it's a war for this box that a lot of you, you the first thing you pick up on the morning and the last thing that falls from your cold hands at night which means that we're not competing. I'm not just competing against Ira Glass and other station anymore. I'm competing against Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones. And so, which means, in a lot of ways, it is going to be more niche, and you have to really activate the piece of the niche that you get. Uh, clothing, jewelry, whatever it is, they got, you got to, you got to, you got to create a lifestyle around this thing in order to keep these people, and there really is a war. Um, one thing that I've started to see uh, is a lot more listening parties and things like that, people coming together to have an audio experience. I heard about a lot of this going uh, on with S-Town. It's kind of like a book club, you know? As, as this medium, as this, this, this on-demand audio medium uh, makes experiences that are more like reading novels, you know, albeit, you know, with a book club, you're not reading together, actually. You're getting together to discuss. But, but we're seeing people coming together, sitting in a room, having a drink, listening to something together, and then having a conversation. Um, and I think that's a really lovely thing. And also, the other sort of peculiar cultural thing that I've started to see springing up are these um, theatrical events that are listening experience. You were talking about movie of the mind. There was a I'm trying to remember. It's a British company. They were just here a few weeks ago. And I went to, um, to, to the Bing concert hall at Stanford to, to hear their, well, it was a play, but it was, they put blindfolds on us. And all we were doing was sitting in the room together, 150, 200 of us, and just listening to this thing for an hour and a half. Or if some of you are familiar with Audium, which is actually an old thing in San Francisco that's been on forever and still runs, where you can just get together in a room with all these people and have this sonic experience, like a communal 
sound bath. It's very in right now. So again. Simon McBurney has a play called The Encounter. That's right, it's That's on all, here. It's, it's all, all here done now. through headphones. These are the art people, they know this. Well, we've had this communal experience that is a sound and audio and visual experience with, may I just say, Meyer sound equipment tonight. Isn't it been great to really actually hear, hear, the, hear the speakers work? Um, uh, I, I'm sure we have some questions or comments or follow-up in the audience, and I am also going to be passing around my microphone for it. So, any questions so far? Oh, we're going to start over here. We'll start over here and then come to you. Thank you, guys. Um, so, I'm curious, um, at least with the cultural criticism part of this, uh, panel, um, movies, art, they all have their own critics and sections in newspapers and magazines where people are doing reviews. Um, and audio has really sort of either escaped or been ignored <laughs> from that sort of criticism. Um, when a big podcast like S-Town comes out, sometimes there's a frenzy to cover it, but then audio sort of disappears in the media of, you know, what, not just what people are recommending, but how we're thinking about the medium and the structure. And I'm first wondering why you think that is, and also if it's a good or a bad thing for the, like, the growth of this art form. So you're talking about criticism in the audio format? Actually, it or seems more like you're talking about sound pieces as art forms that aren't covered, or? Correct. Yeah. Correct. But interesting that it can... It could be both. Oh. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that um, because it's still viewed as niche, and when you look at when someone who is new to the form looks at the mess that is an iTunes podcast directory, <laughs> yeah. um, that it, it just, I think this is the, big, the biggest barrier from all the research so far to people continuing once they do in fact listen to a podcast, if they're going back to that thing, is the fact that the directory systems are completely crazy. They don't have enough of a real um, uh, uh, rating system and the ratings that are there, it's iTunes stuff and it's completely haphazard and ridiculous and stupid. I think that and, and, and this did happen, and you can, you can say the same thing, actually, for television. Um, but they've just had a little bit longer. We do have certain types of guideposts. There are some 200,000 podcasts right now, and no one's even pretending to review this stuff. Actually, we do have a series where we re review podcasts and speak to podcast hosts at KQD called If Ifall. Yes, uh, and there's and there's lots of this. Like there's there's other podcasts that are coming up. Podcast review podcasts. What I'm, I guess what I'm saying is a system. I think right now because you have kind of still an iPhone's monopoly, and um, they're really the review thing is gone. I think I honestly think that right now, and this might be a um, a, um, a minority opinion, but I honestly think that that is it. It may have helped us get to the point where we are right now. I think that we might be, I think that it's gonna, things are going to have to change soon. I'll put it to you this way. Um, in the same way that I know our show was able to develop without, um, before NPR realized that they had, a sh you know, that lots of people listening to our show, two years in, that's when they start paying attention to it. And because of that, we were able to kind of do our own thing for a while. I think right now the podcast had to kind of find its own footing before the big money people come in. And they're coming right now. And they're going to come with their little directories and their little guidebooks and all their little stuff and their, um, and their competitors to the iTunes ecosystem. Because it is, there is an iTunes ecosystem monopoly. And I think that it's good they're coming now. But um, I am glad that there was for a while and still is this huge just foment and I, I really do appreciate those two jackasses in the basement talking to each other. Yeah, about it's easy the, for you to say because they're not kicking your ass in the ratings. I was going to ask a question. Is that okay? Yeah. 
Do any of you have um, important childhood radio memories that you would share with us? I have one. Uh, our family used to camp all the time, and I, we would stay up late at night with our transistor radio and listen. CBS used to run the radio mysteries, radio mystery theater. It came out. People remember that incredibly well produced radio dramas, and I love them. And we would be in the tent uh, up in the Sierras, and you pick up an AM signal, listening to the CBS radio drama hour. It was amazing, and it was there were mo there were modern productions. They weren't reruns. I grew up uh, in England with the BBC, and uh, I loved, I, you know, we would listen all the time, but I remember being really little, and I think the BBC announced they were having a children's radio play competition, and me and my brother entered it, uh, making, we made a play about our cat who got to be in the Olympic Games in our play. And then they, I don't think it was a competition, actually. I think anyone could go. They invited a whole bunch of kids anyway with our wacky ideas to, to, to London to, to uh, spend a day, I don't know, workshopping our, our ideas and writing and whatever. I have a very powerful memory of getting up there and me and my brother doing our little cat scene at the Olympics. Yeah, um, I grew up in an uh, end of days apocalyptic religious cult. And, one of the, and they had a television show and a radio show. And um, and what that we would tape on the cassette sometimes and listen to, and the TV show would come out as well. It was called the uh, the World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong, and um, listening to those things as a child, um, that was my first audio storytelling. Um, the end time is nigh. Um, get your shit together, cause um, you know Jesus is gonna be here next week. And uh, you know, and that, and it was, it was powerful to me. I, it's, it's virgin, yeah, it's right. It's, it's, it's scared to put Jesus out of me. And I think that um, it really has kind of impact. I don't want to start anyone's cult, but it's definitely um, shaped the way I think about story. That would be a great podcast right now, wouldn't it? Oh my gosh! That's Wait a minute. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm a huge fan of podcasts and radio. And I actually had a question for you. Why did you pick audio and sound as a medium to tell stories? And if you were not doing this, what else would you be doing? Is that for all of us? Uh, I've been a print reporter my whole life. I was at the LA Times. And I don't know if it's true or not. There's a, you know, if you throw a frog in a pot of boiling water, it'll jump out. If you put it in cold water and turn it on a flame, it'll be boiled alive. I was a frog in a pot of water at the LA Times, and it was about 190 degrees, and I had a chance to jump out. Um, I just thought audio was a different way of telling stories, and I'd done all I could do in print. And it was a new challenge, a new chapter, and the station was creating a show, and they said, we'll give you staff, we'll give you editors, and you can try to do it. And I said, why not? Um, I also come from a, a print background, and uh, how I got into radio is simply through this singing obsession I had. I found that I was pitching a lot of stories as a print journalist, actually a few to the LA Times, um, to do with different voice subjects. Uh, it was just where my interests were leading me. And so I just sort of dreamed up this idea for this. I, I thought it would be really interesting to explore voice in a medium that seemed very suited to it, which is audio. Um, so I pitched the idea of a, a radio series. Uh, having had absolutely no experience in radio in my life, and no idea how to start anything on my own. Anyway, I pitched it to KLW, and and the uh, station manager there happened to have, I think, five hour-long holes available at around, I think it was a 10 p.m. slot on a Friday or something really unpopular like that. But he said, go on, kids, see what you can do. And and, and yeah, I, I, I guess he thought the uh, what I attempted to do was was okay because he then gave me a you know a, a permanent slot so that's how I got into it and I had to learn everything from scratch and it's a very different telling stories in audio is it, in many ways I mean the basics a good story is a good story right but the techniques and the, the tools that you use and the way you approach it is quite different when you're doing <coughs> audio so it was very interesting for me to kind of go through that process of relearning my craft in a way as a, as a journalist as a storyteller in this medium. Um, for myself, um, so let me just say this. Um, a lot of people in the room I know are writers of various types, 
and um, producers of various types. And the best, one of the best pieces of advice I can give to anybody is to make sure you have a partner who understands where you're coming from. And by that, I mean this. Um, when you write a piece, a story, or do a film, whatever it may be, you show it to your mama, your girlfriend, your, your husband, maybe whatever it is, and they'll give you the best advice they can. But they may not know where you're coming from. They might not understand what it is you're trying to do. If I write a story and show my mother, she's going to say it needs more Jesus. <laughs> That's not probably going to be very helpful to where I'm coming from. Um, I was very, and, and you might not, you might not know that person in your in your creative sphere right now. That's what the internet's for. But finding that person is very, very important. And I think that, and so for myself, um, I was working with a guy, um, Mark Ristich, and we were doing all kinds of stuff. As far as how I got into audio, we made music, short films, plays, um, all kinds of different things because we kind of understood where the other guy was coming from, and you oftentimes need someone to say, that's stupid. Um, and um, do something else or fix it here, but they still overall get where you're going. And, find, and finding that creative partner was so, I cannot tell you how helpful that has been and um, how to get an audio is because we were throwing darts at the board. I mean, just throwing darts at the, at the same year, uh, you know, I wrote a, a symphony, did a short film, wrote a short story, wrote a play. Uh, you know, some, I thought I was a storyteller. I didn't know what was going to hit. And now we're still kind of hitting all these various things because you kind of have to these days. I don't think there's you, it, just trying to, the media changes every three to six months right now. You're running as fast as you can to stand still. And um, so I, I guess I don't see myself as, as a pure audio guy. Uh, well, so thank you very much. Um, I have another question on the, the sort of the medium and the art sort of relationship. Um, the way I see it is, is, you know, storytelling, the art of storytelling was coming along in a, in a pretty terrific way for about the last 20 years on the radio. And, and uh, podcasts sort of hit about 10 years ago and sort of picked that up and, and amplified it. Um, and it seems to be sustaining it that way. Um, I'm just curious how you see it evolving, whether storytelling can stay at the center of podcasting, where the shock jocks and other things from other radio f forms might come across as popular, uh, represented as popularly as some of the storytelling uh, podcasts. I guess, and, and, I, and I appreciate this, this, um, this question, um, because it's people, are you gonna, what's the storytelling thing gonna be with, po with podcasting? Again, I don't necessarily care about podcasting as much as I care about this audio medium, whatever you wanna call it. And it just seems like we never wonder, are movies gonna go away? Or is television gonna go away? If somebody makes a good TV show, people are gonna watch it. If someone makes a good movie, probably look at that too. I think the same thing here. And we have not yet begun to play with this medium. Where is a good superhero podcast at right now? Where is a good children's podcast? Where is a good thing that combines some, you know, um, I want a good Bigfoot podcast. I want a one that puts some, that really combines um, the musicality that you can get in audio into and combining it with storytelling effectively. We have not even begun gun to scratch the surface of the dream of what um, this thing is and, and I think it's and, and it, which means it's wide open and it's, there's a lot of talented people out there and they're all going to take their piece I think that's great I really really do um, and you good stuff it is so hard to make something good everything wants to suck and eventually when, when we do get our sort of uh our, uh, our grading matrices thing down right where we can understand what where the good stuff is at. I just think it just so much. This putting on headphones right now is it's just it's a whole new world. And it's, and, and now you're talking about people going into the virtual reality stuff. How do you meld those two things right now? How do you the the way that video gaming and and um and and um on demand video and everything is sort of merging and putting the phone in front of your eye? Shh. <laughs> Sorry. I mean everything he said basically. Yeah. more about uh, film and YouTube and also then starting to think about what is going to happen in terms of 
VR and augmented reality and yes, putting the phone in front of your face as you go. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, all right. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna give you your microphone back. <laughs> oh yeah, because I'm sure I would love to hear what Glenn has to say about it. Um, how do you, like when you were talking about radio versus podcasts, uh, I have a love-hate relationship with iPhones. I worked at the Genius Bar for four years, so I would dr drop this one in the little river over there paying for my parking ticket. So uh, just before I got here, but how do you <laughs> how do you keep it a democratic art form? You know, the radio, like you said, people in Texas, people who can't afford an iPhone have the possibility potentially of running into something on public radio but even like when it comes to public radio it's so such a tiny bit of the spectrum that's available to the general listening audience across the united states and then you know how do you reach people who who don't have access to this technology and get their stories right, because I think e even with radio you still need to have you know most people listening in their cars you have to have a car, a lot of people anyway, or you have to have a ra some radio playing device in your house. I mean, I don't know, you, it's impossible. you have to have some technology. I mean, short of it be being beamed out, I was just in Indonesia and they have, they, they beam out uh, from all the mosques where I was, they were beaming out uh, people, you know, on, in addition to the call to prayer, in mat to the mass public, anything that they wanted everyone to hear. You know, it's a bit like, 1984, and who wants that? You know, I, but the, but this is a this is an important question. Well, the, and the thing we have not even mentioned is the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and what its impact if it goes away is going to be. KPCC gets five percent of its budget from the CPP. It's about 1.3 million dollars, which is my show off the air. I mean, if you were to do dollar for dollar, but when you get to rural radio, you get to Kansas, Oklahoma, you know, small signal public radio stations for a lot of people that's the only access to news and information they have so if that money goes away there's going to be a cataclysmic effect on news and information i mean our podcast is free but you do have to have access to a device to listen to it i think the barriers to creating the content and hearing it are low i'm much more concerned about if cpb neh nea money goes away and what that's going to mean to the quality of arts journalism and public radio Sorry, can I, uh, is there another question? There we go, thank, thank you. Um, so my question is re really similar and it was a question about audience composition. Um, earlier on, on in, in, in the session, you, you've talked about how one podcast will tell, will um, advertise another podcast and so you sort of get like the same people listening to the same podcast. And I was really interested in how, how do you, it's sort of just a really similar question, how do you get, how do you outreach? How do you, how does someone start listening to a podcast? And, and I guess a, a, a secondary question is, um, if someone wants to do cultural criticism, and you've sort of answered this s similarly too, but why, why, choose, why choose this medium to do cultural criticism? Thank you. Why not? Um, they, they, I don't think that it's necessarily automatic that you do choose this medium. It just seems like um, <laughs> it, it, there's, it's, it's wide open right now, and that if you find an area that you can actually get a little space in, it might be worth a little try. Uh, I don't, but I don't. There's, there's lots of other things to be done. There's lots of other ways to, mm. to talk to people, and especially, I, I, I kind of recoil against the idea of cultural criticism. Maybe you know, look, we're all university people here, but that just seems a little bit too elitist for me. The cultural criticism of the podcast. Um, I, I, what, listen, what, what do you like? Why do you like it? How do they do it? Can I do it? How can I do it on a smaller scale? If you talk about your, your question earlier, what I think is great is you because you don't have to go mass market anymore. When you're talking about what can, what can you make, I need to be able to make something, hopefully, that can pay for itself. That's basically what you're talking about. Now, I don't have to make Fast and the Furious. I don't need $500 million. If I can make a show that covers me and my equipment walking around doing my thing, then I've succeeded on an amazing scale. And that is what people are doing right now. And, and 
So you got to kind of call call your shot. The the one thing that both myself and my partner wanted to do, and we've said to each other, we wrote it down in a, in a, in a contract, is we wanted to be working artists. That was pretty much our goal. So, um, and and that, oh, no, we wanted to be artists that could pay the rent. That's what it was. <laughs> artists that can pay the rent. That's was that traditionally and always has been very, very, very hard to do, to be one of those people. And I think that this medium actually provides a lot more opportunities for people to, to do that. To this question of cultural criticism, um, as somebody who, you know, I, I was a theater critic for many years and a music critic, and, you know, we've seen what's happened to the environment, the critical environment in, in journalism. It's kind of, it was, it was very much a bastion of print, really, for a long time and it's we've seen it kind of fall off for a variety of reasons it has existed on the radio but you know it, it exists in two forms and both of them i think frankly suck you know traditionally there was usually uh, an old white dude reading his review of something for five minutes um just reading it verbatim or you have a group of people, maybe they're exciting, funky young people from diverse backgrounds, but they're still having, you know, a sort of a rambling conversation about some movie they've seen or whatever. And I think neither, these two seem to be the basic ways it's done in as much as it's done at all in audio at this point. And there are a lot of cultural criti criticism focused um, on-demand audio podcast type experiences right now. So I would love and welcome experiments in cultural criticism in audio that are, you know, interesting, vital, that really tickle your, your ears and your brain in, in a way. Um, because we don't have it right now. And, and I, I, think it's, I think it's valuable. It's one of these things that helps people get out of the echo chamber too. Because, you know, if you're... If you're just listening to your friends and looking on your Facebook feed and whatever it is for, oh, you know, this is what I want to go see, this is what I want to go read, this is what I want to listen to, then you get much more into this kind of bubble thing. But sometimes if you've got really smart, intelligent people who have a deep knowledge and are great, entertaining communicators of that knowledge, it, it gets you to try things that you might not otherwise try and gets you to understand ideas you might otherwise not think about. So this is why I think cultural... Cult cultural criticism is valid, important, necessary. It's gone by the wayside. Can audio pick it up and do something thrilling with it? I would love for you to try. All right, a last question. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question for, for all three of you guys about uh, editing, the editing process. When you're working on a story, uh, you know, you're out reporting it or doing these interviews, you've got hours and hours of tape, tons of details. It's all very interesting. How do you decide when you're producing the actual story what to narrow in on, focus in on? Obviously, you probably have like an idea about what the narrative is, but once you get down to like the details, I'm wondering if you can share some ideas or tips about zeroing in on the most important things um, that you, you know, are, are looking for when you're producing a story. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I don't know, edit my own pieces, but it's a huge part of what the team on our show di does. We had a piece that ran last week uh, called The 14th Factory. It's a, about a three-acre series of warehouses that an artist, Simon Birch, has taken over and put installations in. I walked around with him for an hour, and we cut it down to 11 minutes. Um, and what we did is, we, after we left, the producer said to me, what do you think were the best bits? Uh, as if I were telling, you know, you, here's what I saw, here's what was amazing. It's, it's how I learned to write a newspaper story. It's like, get all your facts, and like, what would you tell your mom happened? And that's the lead of your story. So we would caucus, we wouldn't listen to any tape. I would say, I, I remember this part being really good. I liked when he talked about the car crash and the people on the swings. And it's like the things that we remembered were the things that we wanted to focus on. Whittling it down was a whole nother piece of work, but the things that you remember being the most interesting are almost always the things that are the most interesting. Yeah, to, to your point, this is very true. When I, all those years that I sat in darkened theaters uh, writing about plays and musicals and operas and things like that, I think I was the only critic in the house who didn't have a notebook with them and was furiously scribbling things away with a little stupid pen light that distracted your neighbors. Because I was of the mind, 
that if the next day, the thing that you remember is the, th is the thing you should really focus on. That's the thing. And it's the same, you know, when, you're, when I'm working on a, a feature story or something for, the, for audio, like what are the things that really just jump out of you? The, what's the big surprise? The thing that, but then beyond that, th there's that process. But then for me, there's this other process that go hand in hand. The other process is the somewhat laborious but extremely important task of sitting down and going through all your tape. And I know that um, some people may use transcription services for that or whatever, but I think the process of sitting down and listening to the whole thing and forcing yourself to say, yes, at the three minute, 11 second mark, such and such says this mind-blowing thing and you type it all out and, you, and, and, and those bits of interesting sound, oh yeah, 65 minutes into the tape, this is where we hear a loud explosion, you know. And just making myself do that is where all the thinking happens, where the story comes together and you coalesce. And then the third thing is you have to work with a great editor because you can't do it all on your own and it's a collaborative process. You know, I, I think an ideal storytelling team at least has three people in it. You know, really good reporter, really good editor, really good engineer, sound, you know, sound guru, mixer type person. And maybe there are more people that you'd want to include in that mix too. Yeah. I agree with both of those. I want to add this. Um, we we routinely will get, you know, 12, 15, sometimes 20 hours of tape for a 12-minute story. And what you're looking to do is obviously go through and pull out the gold. And the gold sometimes is very, very rare in that. Um, the gold, by what I mean is, where do I feel that the there's an emotive situation here. Where do I feel there's an emotive connection? Something going on. Someone feels something. The, what you're trying to do at some point is make sure that the audience feels something too. If you feel something, if they feel something, the audience is going to feel something. And you pull out those parts. And there's going to be a few, like make something very few. And the rest of it is connective tissue. And trying to find how to put those things together. And what I love, what John and I were talking about earlier today was like you put these things together and you know, you've, you've, you've taken these hours of tape and made this story. And the person says, oh, you know, I'm really glad I said it like that. <laughs> you, you didn't do what? Some, and, 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 then, um, and then what I, I really liked, I got an iTunes review and I said, you know, I don't understand why they play reruns. So all they have to do is get someone to talk and then they put some music under it. How hard can it be? Um... And I, what I, and I do love that because it makes the process invisible, and people don't, and they don't understand. There's, there's no art form where people can actually see the work and the fissures and things. You're trying to remove all that from the whole thing, and then is <laughs> making it look easy is the hardest thing in the world. And um, it's just something you really, you, re it's just that work, um, and and making sure that you are not going to put out anything that sucks, making that commitment to yourself. Let me, let me say this last thing. I got a chance to spend some time this afternoon watching a couple of journalism classes at Cal. One was a photo class, one was a writing class. And the thing that both classes were about is like, as a group, you know when something's working and you know when it's not. It's not a math thing, it's an emotional thing. It's like, that's a good picture. That one really tells a story. That is a really good piece of editing because they're focusing on, if you can remove yourself as the listener to your own piece, just as you become the editor of your own writing, you've solved half the battle. That you're listening to your own work the way an audience would. And if you can do that, just as you revise your own copy as an editor, or you edit out your bad photos, then you're 90% there. On the theme of the Cal class, I'm going to ask you guys to close with just some parting thoughts for us here at Berkeley um, as we um, try to continue this, these kind opportunities for these kinds of dialogue um, with adjacent to classes and also offering chances for our students and community to interact. Um, what is what do you want Berkeley's role to be in plotting this next future? All that we're talking about today about working across media, making sure that this stays democratic. Um, John, you're a Cal alum. Um, I'm Lynn, a Cal alum a who applied to be a writer for the Daily California and they turned me down. And I went on to be a professional journalist my whole life. So don't let people tell you no and pay attention to them. 
Um, the greatest gift that Cal gave me was a great liberal arts education. I was a theater student and I read and I learned to be a critical thinker. And I had teachers who were relentless with me about clarifying my writing. And I left Cal a really good writer because I had teachers who hounded me and they made me smart because they demanded that I be my best. And they made me think critically. They made me look at the world, a history class, an English class, a theater class, and defend my ideas. And I walked out of here defending my ideas. It was the best thing they could do as a journalist, the best thing they could do making me a citizen of the world to make sure that what I believed in, I could explain and argue for. This, this is what I would um, uh, ask you, people to think about a little bit. Is in the same way that you, we kind of have, in a, be entrepreneurial about our organizations and, and going into new media, this type of thing. You have to be entrepreneurial about your education. And about, and my, like th by, by that I mean this. Um, oftentimes, the university experiences, they're not necessarily teaching you what you need to know to do this. People who come into an audio field have got to know how to use Pro Tools, sound equipment, visual equipment, um, Adobe um, systems better than I do. The new people coming into it have to be able to do it better than me, right? And you're oftentimes studying theory and running around in this kind of nonsense, I shouldn't say nonsense, but this type of thing, <laughs> you don't actually do the stuff. Our first, every person that we hire, the first question we ask them is, "What did you make? What you what you make? Can you you gotta you the, the for radio audio the, the 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 cutting tape is the core essential thing to be able to make this happen. You've got to be able to cut tape. You better be able to take some pictures. You got to be able to edit all that stuff together. You I I I, I can say this again and again, but I am so dead serious. You've got to know it better than me, right? And um." And that means that, and that and the, putting that ass power in to do it and making sure that you are taking control of your own educational experience and making stuff right now where you, where you, when you actually have some space to be able to experiment. Um, I might add to that the importance of a university campus as a community. And um, even though in some ways making audio can be quite a solitary experience, especially when you get to the point where you're logging all that tape and putting it together and mixing it and so on. You know, I, I would encourage you all just to sort of find your people and find people to to talk to, to riff with, to ch exchange ideas with. Um, every good story, I think, begins with a conversation with someone else. You know, you can't just dream stuff up out of nowhere. You can't live in a vacuum. So... Getting out there and talking to people. Sometimes you can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Except for Glenn. I couldn't do it. But, but just kind of being aware that you're part of a university environment with just all these people with these experiences and, and potentially an infinite number of amazing stories. So I'd encourage you all to, um, you know, even the introverts among you, uh, get, you know, get out there and, and have some conversations and see where, where those stories might lead you. Okay, critical thinking, making, community. Sounds like actually pretty great core values <laughs> of Berkeley and of this incredible team. Thank you so much for joining us and thank, thank you. you all for staying.